Okay, so we got the train going just down the hill. That goes every few hours both ways. Lots of fun graffiti on it and other imagery. And we're in this amazing park-like setting. You can see through the trees there the sound. And uh, that would be uh, part of the Seattle, I believe, Seattle side of the Puget Sound. And there's a sailboat mast going just from right to left of the trees, if you can spot that. The train is still going. Once the train gets through, we'll be able to hear the stream. <laughs> okay. Still going. These are long trains, usually two or even three engines. Cars going by, headed for parts away from the marina. Most of them are coming out of the marina. That's about the only thing that's down there on the other side of the train. It's a big right of way that the freight trains and passenger trains will have the express to Bellingham or Vancouver, BC come around too. There's the end of the train. So we'll just pan over here to the creek. And then up the hill, up the creek, without a paddle. Some little spots of light shining. That's from the sun coming through the trees. It's really cool. It's really filtered light. You can even see, I'll come over here to the steps. And it's kind of a lot more than 39 steps. That's the last of the ladies that just walked up all this at the top. And down, which you've probably already seen, is step, step, step. All these steps with the cobbles. And of course it goes up on the other side of the steps too. All the way up into the canopy. It's quite a tall canopy, probably 50 to 100 feet. There's uh, cedar, fir, deciduous. Some of them are stuck with the ivy problem, which you have to kind of work on. Um, so um, I'll get started with my little talk here and hopefully we won't get too interrupted. Might have to stop it if somebody, I don't want to put somebody on camera that they don't want to be on, but I'll just set this here and talk for a little bit. Get my book out. So this is Steve, uh, also known as Paul Marks, coming at you from the very wonderful park. Uh, probably no more than five minutes walk from uh, where you'll see images, video of the Sahara Oceanographer going the other way into the Ballard downtown area where the ship canal is and where the 303 footer is sitting there at Stafford Maritime. Uh, so whether or not we get that, we may not, but we're working hard on it. And uh, that's no more than about maybe 10 minutes walk from here. And it's very different here than it is in that industrial area that has all of the shipbuilding going on. And all the ship, re not shipbuilding so much as ship maintenance and rehab and just all cleaning, all kinds of things go on and have been going on for well over 100 years in that ship canal. It's really old part of the Seattle fabric. The uh, Chittenden locks are there where we have the fish ladders and the salmon are in there, huge salmon. I just saw those today. And uh, it's also where the boats come and go into the lakes, for Lake Union and Lake Washington. They all come through those locks. Okay, so uh, this is a video of um, three parts I've got uh, where we're going, that's uh, part one, and then part two is uh, how to get there, and there's actually three subparts to part two, so it's 
really four parts if you count all three parts of the how to get there. It's a little bit easier to point where you want to go and then it's a little bit harder to figure out how you're going to get there. It took a long time. I've been working on this in some respects for 40 years and especially almost full time for, I don't know, maybe 10, 12, probably longer, 14 years, something like that from the time I started online with my own servers and my own 10,000 member bulletin board in 1995. My oldest domain is coming up on 20 years old, and so I've been at this a while. So the first uh, piece of this is where we're going, and I, I put down pound what the fuck, or pound WTF, which one of my partners online uh, translates to what the future, what the future, WTF, which I think is kind of a cool use of WTF. That's used in SMS texting, and who knows, maybe even SMS with the S in front of the texting, uh, and you could also pronounce it, what the few, uh, like F-E-W, which most people aren't going to the future. They're stuck right now or even trying to go to the past. And so what the few, sure, uh, the future makes sense because there's very few people that are really doing very much about trying to build a new future, either for themselves or for their families or for their planet or for whatever organization they're trying to build for. They're just kind of treading water or even going backwards and failing. And that's unfortunate, but that's what we're trying to remedy as best we can. So I've got five things down here that are where we're going, and these are part of the project. They're not the whole project, but they're going to get people's attention. And that's why I put them this high up in the list of this discussion, is that people respond to things, ideas, memes, processes, where they're primitive part of their brain, the amygdala, the part of the brain that's in the brain stem, that's the oldest part of the brain, that makes the brain chemicals that are the same that are made when you're having sex, or when you're having a great meal, or when you propose and she says yes and her face lights up, or he. Uh, the first one is cave key. This is way off the charts, uh, reaching for a very special island in the sun, in the Exumas, right next door to David Copperfield's Mushu Key, also known as Copperfield Bay, which is 700 acres, approximately 11 keys, or 11 little islands that make up Copperfield Bay, also known as, previously known as, or still known as, alias Mushu Key. And Cave Key is about 200 and something acres with uh, something like 19,000 square feet of buildings, and a 50-slip marina, and an airstrip, and it's rowing distance. It's a rowing distance from Copperfield Bay. I mean, you could literally get in a shell and row over there. Uh, and it's a hundred plus million. So it's kind of a reach, but uh, they, uh, they, they said they'd carry a contract, so we can get it. I know we can get it. Uh, it's gonna be a really, really critical component of Atlantic operations, Caribbean operations, eastern seaboard and gulf coast operations cave key and you'll see pictures of that uh, in a different part of this so that's an example of the island an example of a motorized vessel motorized yacht and this is part of the bicycle acronym which is bus island yacht crow's nest uh, the motorized version is the Sahara Oceanographer, and it's a 3,700-ton, 303-foot ex-NOAA vessel. That would be National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association. And uh, $120 million was spent on that vessel by the federal government to build what, at the time, I think it was in the 60s, 1960s, the largest vessel ever built for NOAA. And it was built to circumnavigate at the equator without refueling, 25,000 nautical mile range. And it has some 2 million nautical miles on its ship's log, 2 million nautical miles over the 30 or 40 years that it did NOAA service. And I mean, this thing's crazy, five decks, and there's this huge 
roll-up garage door, 30 feet high, 20 feet wide, something like that, that, that launched the weather balloons. And there's just a lot of room. It supported 200 scientists. There's rooms everywhere, decks everywhere, post office, a surgery lab, a dental lab, all this stuff. And nobody knows what to do with it. It's old. It's uh, tired. It's old technology. But it's been in fresh water. It was the breakwater for Kirkland, Washington, for quite a few years because they wouldn't let them build a real breakwater, so they just moved this thing in there. It's big, 303 foot. It'll be in the top 20 private yachts in the world uh, once it's classified as a yacht, not a research vessel. So that would be uh, kind of the uh, grand dam of the whole operation on the world's oceans because it's never going to stop. It's going to put in ports of call all around the world, circumnavigate constantly, and make a whole bunch of money for oceans and land habitat and kids and pets. Then the third one is the Barbie Bar Ranch. I like to call it the Barbie Bar Ranch because of Barbie and Barbie dolls, and I know some Barbies. Uh, and that's part of the crow's nest. That's kind of a crown jewel of the crow's nest. It's 72 acres on the Snake River, five miles from the Grand Teton National Park entrance with something like 15,000 square feet of buildings, including one that has its own observatory and an 8,500 square foot main lodge. It's 24 million, it's to die for. It's gonna bring a lot of big players to the table. Oh yes, it will. And it's like nine minutes from Jackson, uh, uh, Wyoming, and the airport. And it's, you can just wander out into a field and there are the Tetons. And you've got a mile of the snake on the property that you can fly fish. Uh-huh. So that would be Barbie Bar. That's the crow's nest. And these are at the top. There's gonna be much, much, lower on the totem pole pieces of the bicycle approach to this. So we're not going to just have a 3,700 ton NOAA vessel. We're gonna have skiffs <laughs> on the other end and dories and sabots that teach kids how to sail and navigate and steer a boat uh, and everything in between. Like the Deerfoot 2, which is a 72 foot sloop by Steve Dashu and his lovely physicist hull designing wife that can just circle the globe without even breathing and surfs down waves at 20 knots even though it's a sailboat the deer foot too look that one up uh, so everything in between but these are the big ones just to get people to go really you're kidding you're going after what several hundred million dollars worth of assets for marketing purposes uh-huh okay, and then uh, the fourth one is a four travel and a four travel is one of the high-end land yachts I call them and uh, there are several uh, from the big uh, uh, Mon Monaco's and the Gillig buses and the converted trailways buses uh, to the lesser uh, that are still great you know Winnebago's anything you can come as you are in your broken car with a tent and a v-dub bug and make money in a campground but the more interesting the vehicle is and the more interesting what the vehicle is pulling behind it like a little ranger tug or something really interesting that people just can't look away from. Well, easier the marketing is. So the four travels are just an extreme example of a rig that sold for 200, 300, 400,000, and they're all diesel pushers. And they have big engines in them, and they're all fixed up on the inside. And they don't have the punch outs, you know, the living room that sticks out the expandos, all of which leak, unless they're a $400,000 rig. And they're for sale for pennies on the dollar, like all these are. They're all for sale, except the island, of course. The island's not pennies on the dollar. Uh, and then the fifth one is the sailing part of the large vessel. And this is a large one. This is the Tole Moor. And that is a 156-foot, three-masted tall ship with a 31-foot beam that has about a crew of, I don't know, eight or nine. And it's for sale for, again, pennies on the dollar. And we're going after it. And uh, it's an example at the top end of uh, the sailing vessel spectrum, uh, the Deerfoot 2 of which is an example. And another one, I was just looking at a about a thirty to $50,000 Formosa catch that's sitting in Florida, right on the coast in one of the ports, St. Pete's or uh, Tampa, for 12000 For Really? And it's circumnavigable for 12000 It's all fixed up. It needs a little polish around the edges, but ready to go. Uh, and the Tolly Moore is a sailing school vessel, or SSV, and it's taking kids out 
a hundred of them at a time or more, teaching them how to sail. It has a square rig in the front, three masts. It's, I believe, the largest functioning tall ship in the Western Hemisphere, or the Western North America at least. And that is going to anchor, or otherwise be the grand dame of the sailing fleet, which will number scores of sailing vessels up to and including in excess of a hundred foot sailing vessel with more than one mast, schooners, catches, and probably even more than just this one three-masted schooner because those leave a mark on people's psyche and they want in, they want part of that. That's kind of the way the human brain works. So uh, those are the five, the Cave Key, the Sahara Oceanographer, Barbie Bar Ranch, the Four Travel is an example. As an example of a high-end uh, land shark and the Tolly Moor, uh, the, the, kind of the top of the line sailing vessel. Uh, the, the next part is how do we get there? How do we get all this stuff? And the stuff in between that gets us to the big stuff, uh, which you kind of have to step up. But you can't just go buy a 3,700 ton NOAA vessel right out of the chute. It doesn't work that way. So got to step up a little bit. Sorry. No, it's good. Uh, so. Part A of this is uh, the early ailments or extreme lifestyle marketing assets that these big vessels and islands and ranches are ailments. They're extreme lifestyle marketing assets and they leave a big, huge mark on people and then they want to do it. Uh, they don't ask questions, they just sign up, they just send their money. That's sex sells itself. You want people to just instinctively do it. Active along here. This is time of evening. So. YouTube video. Word. <laughs> so the Elmas. Uh, here are some examples of some more affordable, affordable Elmas. Not Cave Key and not the twenty-four million dollar Barbie Bar Ranch. Uh, the first one on here is the Queen of Sheba. Uh, that's the John, I call it the John Wayne Consort Vessel, which was the consort of Wild Goose, John Wayne's uh, big three-deck or four-deck little mini cruise ship that he uh, used in the Puget Sound for many, many years. He was a big fan of the Puget Sound and spent a lot of time here, and they named a marina after him on the north end of the Olympic Peninsula in Squim. The marina there is called John Wayne Marina. And on the south end of his domain was John Wayne Airport, which is Irvine, which is close to Hollywood and where he lived, and my old stomping ground. I learned to sail catamarans in Alameda Bay, right down the street from uh, John Wayne Airport, and I bought my first displacement hull, a 35-foot center cockpit Yorktown cutter in Port Angeles, right next door to John Wayne Marina. And I have John Wayne in my name, Stephen Wayne Johnson, so uh, we're kind of, I've kind of been shadowing him. I never met the man, but um, he was a character, and I like his films, and a lot of people do, so he's part of this. Queen of Sheba has real John Wayne art in it, and uh, it's uh, kind of looks really, really like hell on the outside, and it's kind of fixed up on the inside, and it needs a caretaker, an underdog guardian. Uh, we talk about nautical relic guardianship in this, or NRG, which is also the physics or science abbreviation for energy. It's NRG, and that stands for Nautical Relic Guardianship. And that's what we are, is we're relic guardians. All of these, almost all of these, are kind of relics of the past. Some of them have history, some of them don't. All of them make the brain chemicals go wee, and then people buy. And that's the idea. And the second one is the Pisces. That's right here in the Northwest. It's been for sale for a long time. It has historical people involved that I won't go into. And then the third one is uh, the Kirkland, and that's a ferry from the Astoria run, and it's right here uh, in the uh, uh, Olympic Peninsula, Puget Sound area near Seattle. That's what it is. So you know about that. I was down in front of some records. 
Hello. And then the fourth one is, uh, I call it the Mariah. Um, it's um, you know, the carry me. Uh, that would be the Mariah part. Carry me, like Jim Carry, dumb and dumber, which we're trying to get people off the dumb and dumber mark, if you will. Uh, carry me uh, Northwind, uh, which is uh, way out west. We've got a name for rain and wind and fire. Rain is test, the fire is Joe, and they call her in Mariah. So, Northwind, Mariah, Carrie, Jim Carrie. Um, I kind of play with way too many names, and I get sort of tied up with my own thinking, and then I sort of melt, so I uh, have to slow down sometimes. Uh, the fifth one is the Mayan, and that's the Quetzalcoatl component, the, kind of the wild card in this whole thing, and it's in Santa Barbara, and uh, you'll hear more about that later. And then the, uh, the, the second part of this and how to get there is part B, and I've listed this as the digiframe, kind of like a didgeridoo, uh, but it's, it's the part of the framework that is the digital part. And uh, this is a group that's going to literally own the digital space. Uh, digital has come a long ways since we were doing slip connects before point-to-point -point protocol and dial-up when I was an internet service provider in 1995. It's come a long ways. And I've been there every step of the way, the open source movement, uh, the content management systems, uh, blogging, WordPress, Joomla, PostNuke, Drupal, you name it, I've been there, done it. Uh, built thousands of computers, done tech support five years, Global Response Center, uh, uh, Beaverton, Oregon, Stream International, Dell Gateway, 3Com, HP, AT&T. And so I have a lot of experience with the digital side and our, our digital part of this framework is going to be best in breed. It's going to be world class. And it's going to get bigger and better and more powerful every week because the people we're bringing into this also know a lot about digital and a lot about video and a lot about audio and a lot about all of the things that you hear people doing to make money on the internet that most people don't know how to do because they're a lot harder to do than they look or than they're presented when people are telling you, you can just do this stuff and you can just blog daily, you can just build a list and you can just promote a ClickBank product and make all this money. Well, not so much. It's a lot harder than it looks. And a lot of that is kind of smoke and mirrors and obfuscation and really isn't telling you the truth about how difficult it is to make money as a network marketer or an internet marketer or in direct sales or in mail order or in any hybrid of that. It's all blended together now because of the internet. And this is the challenge, is that people want to get out of harm's way, want to stop trading time for money in a day job. I don't care what your day job is, even if you're a brain surgeon or a rocket scientist, you're still trading time for money and you got to go back and trade another day for money and it's not enough it's just not enough you need a more leveraged way of getting money we call it getting instead of making or earning or slaving for because you can just pick it up off the street if somebody has the right model and teaches you how to use the model you need both and you also need mindset and some other things i, I talk about in another video but mostly people don't realize what they're getting into you have to compete with russia and their ability to do things that aren't by the rules if you're going to be on the internet. And people sort of don't really realize that, that they're competing with some very, very smart people that have been doing this for 20 years, including all the big marketers, all the big network marketers, all the big organizations, all the people with big iron, big cars, big houses, big everything. And how are they going to compete with that if they have a day job on Monday? It's really hard, and so they fail. And so that's what we're trying to do is build something that's a really special framework, both on the physical side, which no one's ever done, not really in any substance. I mean, Amway had a yacht in 1960. You know, they brought the people who already had made it to the yacht. Oh, goody. You have to bring the person to the yacht when they first sign up in the first week and then put them on video. Now they can get their own yacht and then they're, you know, helping people by inviting their friends to the yacht that they own, not you, not the house. It's backwards. If you work real hard and you slave and you do all this stuff nobody wants to do, then you get to go on the cruise ship for a weekend. Oh, goody.
that's not going to work. This is different. So, just some examples of the digital framework. I'm one of the largest people in Seattle, which is the largest Twitter city on the planet in Twitter. I've been working on it eight years. I've got millions of followers. They're spread out all over lots of accounts. Uh, I've built for some of the richest marketers on the planet in Twitter. They still don't know what Twitter is. They still don't understand how to connect the dots and what it does for you outside of Twitter. Most that happens on Twitter happens outside of Twitter in the search engines and lots of other places people don't even know about. Uh, so we're, we're going to teach people Twitter. Way different than what they thought Twitter was. It isn't anything that you think it is. Not even close. And then the second thing is a wiki farm. That's a whole bunch of wiki pages. Millions of them, many of which are open source. They call them creative commons. So you can just borrow them and put them on your site and make a whole bunch of money with the search engines because they don't know the difference between your site and Wiktionary and Wikipedia and WikiHow and any other wiki. You're using the same software as those. It's free, open source. A lot of people didn't know that. Not that hard to learn how to do, not that hard to borrow. Get busy, borrow some pages, put about 10 million of them on 50 different domains. Here, here you go, just, just go for it, it's not that hard. Most of this stuff is free. <laughs> How are you? Ah, YouTube videos, you know. Cool. Making another billion, Zuckerberg style. Where can I look you up? Uh, Paul Marks. Just look up Par Marks. I'm all over the place on P A W M A R K S. Cool. Twitter, Facebook, Skype. It's not that hard. Everybody makes this hard. You make a video on a traffic thing, and, and people want to know what you're doing, and pretty soon you just make more money. I mean, this isn't hard. People make it too hard. So, Wiki Farm. If you link wikis, and they're strategically about stuff and you edit the stuff that you borrowed, and you add pages to it, well, you're gonna make a whole bunch of money from wikis. And most people don't even know how to start on the first step of that. It's not that difficult. I've been building MediaWiki, that's the one underlying all these big sites, not these other wikis. Use MediaWiki, figure it out, hire somebody, send it off to Manila or India or Eastern Europe to get it working if you don't know how, and here comes a great big huge marketing lever that you can use for the next 20 years. Who builds it? Not very many. They don't even know MediaWiki can be had just with a download, or it's right in your WHM cPanel back office when you buy a hosting service for four bucks a month. There it is, MediaWiki. Just turn it on, on one of your websites. You do have 10 or 20 or 30 websites, don't you? I've had 200, 250. I've hosted thousands. I've had servers for 20 years. The, the whole machine, you know, not some rented machine. I own the whole, the whole machine, or I lease it. Both, I've had both. At one point, I owned two machines, and I had them co-load. Co it was called, used to be called co-location. There's not as much of that going on, but I did all that, too. And then a network blog. This is like Blogspot or Blogger or some of these other big, huge places where a whole bunch of people are blogging on one single domain. Well, you can build a network blog yourself, and then your domain gets all that search engine traffic because it's a Hefe domain. It's up in the you know, top echelons in the cloud of Alexa, not the cloud that you're paying somebody for. That's important too. We'll have cloud hosting. That, that's powerful and you can do your own video instead of paying somebody else, instead of having YouTube take all your videos down because, I don't know, they had a, a, a wild bad hair day at Google. Google owns YouTube. Uh, but uh, network blogs can be built and they can explode and they can make you a lot of money. Several of my friends have proven that. And then Larboard is a game that I've been working on for a couple of years. It's going to blur the line between making money in the real world and making brownie points in a game because you can't play in Larboard without making money that's translatable into dinner with a debit card from PayPal or whatever, one of your e-currencies. We support lots of e-currencies. PayPal we kind of you know, put up with because it's kind of hard to do eBay without PayPal, but PayPal's a pain in the butt. You want real e-currencies that don't screw around with your money. They actually work like a bank that protects your money, most of them. Some of them don't. PayPal is the worst, one of the worst. Trust me, I've been around it for 15 years. I promoted it originally when it opened. And then uh, peer-to-peering is kind of where the whole world is going. 
Uh, that's what Torrance are about. I grew up in Torrance, California, and Torrance is spelled a little bit differently when you're talking peer-to-peer. -peer. Uh, but this is the future. The future is passing pieces of files among people peer-to-peer -peer instead of logging into a central mainframe and putting up with all Mark Zuckerberg's newest bad hair day stupid example of let's change the interface and throw more ads at you just like Google does. You can get rid of all of that with peering. It's just that somebody has to put the thing together so that people don't have to put up with the ads anymore, don't have to put up with a different user interface every four hours like happens at a lot of these sites. You just get tired of it. So people just wander off. But if you build extensions to the open source software that's out there by the hundreds of open source packages, every single one of which can have an extension put into a central auth system. That's all it does is traffic cop and central auth, just like OAuth. Well, then you're done and you can cut all this other mainframe login, change the game on you and put ads in front of your nose every five seconds. Cut it all loose. Bye bye. It's gone just like Linux did. Linux pretty much cut loose almost all the server operating systems besides one or another flavor of Linux went bye-bye because Linux is open source and it changes about every five seconds in order to keep up with the hackers and the tweakers and the freakers and the kiddies that are trying to break it. It's pretty hard to break Linux. And then data mining and vetting people. That's what you should be using the internet for, not all this other stuff. You shouldn't be teaching on the net. You shouldn't be trying to sell on the net, really. You should just be getting people's attention, and you should be finding out about them, because the internet is this amazing place where people's life story is everywhere, and you can just pick and choose the ones that you want to work with, and then you build a relationship with them off the internet, on a boat. Uh-huh. And guess what? They want to do that, too. They're tired of building a relationship asynchronously with text and other stuff. You know, it's, it's really hard to have sex on the internet, isn't it? You can just see depictions of it. Oh, whoopee. You know, there's no touching on the internet, really, to speak of, is there? So, and then part C is, uh, I call it the brick shit house, or, or the bitch snake structure, the B-S-H. Uh, B for the bitch, and the uh, shit is uh, the snake, and then the house is H is just the structural character, H, I beam, on its side, structure. And that's the backbone, if the yachts and the islands and the Bourne network, which is every hundred miles along the continents of the world, we have another Bourne station where you learn stuff and you mastermind and you get make new friends and you see new things for that particular locale. That's the Blue Ocean Underground Railway network. Those are definitely backbones because that's what no one else does is the physical stuff where you learn things that are not marketing. You learn how to repel, you learn how to fly, you learn how to navigate. You learn how to kayak. You learn things that everybody wants to learn anyway. And then you learn a little bit of marketing at the end of the day when you've had so much fun that you actually remember what you learned about the technical stuff. You know, how to turn on a blog or some of the things that we talked about in this talk. Uh, you, you can't spend the whole day on that stuff and then pull the slot machines at night in the casino that's right down the street and have anybody remember anything. That's not the way the brain works. You need fun most of the day, 80% of the day, 90% of the day, 10% of learning in the evening or at the beginning, and then go have fun the whole rest of the day and do it again tomorrow. And then guess what? People bring their friends to that one, <laughs> especially if it's mega yachts and private islands and you're off fly fishing you know, for most of the day, and then you learn for an hour or even a half hour at night. you, you got to keep the learning down because they, they remember it. Uh, they, they remember it. They remember it more deeply, and they retain it 10 years from now. They still remember that training because of all the fun they had that day. This is the way the brain works. You've got to teach the way the brain works, and most people don't. So I got a half a dozen items here. Uh, the direct response nerve center. Uh, that's essentially we function as your direct response fulfillment house. We send the stuff out. We do it right every single time. It's check and cross check we have quality control over the package it goes out with as if you sent it yourself and it goes out from more than one center so it gets there pretty quick uh, we may send it FedEx we may send it with a mail service by the country that you're sending it to and we have 
a, a station in that country, so it goes from that place, so it's postmarked in that place, and it looks really local. It's like, wait a minute, I thought they were, yep, <laughs> it's pretty cool. And uh, also, it sends out not just mail, or not just uh, treatments, which would be uh, like a book or a custom book that we bind and we send out with your name on it, like, like you printed it personally. YouTube videos. Yeah. Uh, but also lumpy packages. So you have the bubble wrap and you've got to know what's in it. You tear it open and there's this out-of-box experience with an OBE and uh, the people are freaking out because you send them a flash drive and you send them a calligraphy invite and you send them stuff that they weren't expecting. And that's what out-of-box experience is all about. And we're going to do that from a central processing place, uh, a, a nerve center that does all that stuff for you. So all you do is send in 60 second intro video with you on it if you're so inclined and you bundle that with we bundle that with your images of yourself still images and custom paragraphs you've written that make sense for that particular candidate that particular KC or knight candidate we call our people knights not customers not joint venture partners they're knights of the realm of a night ship and you'll hear more about night ships in this The, the direct response nerve center takes care of all that for you. See, because people don't get around to it, and you know, weeks go by and they still haven't sent the thing in the mail. And we'll also use third-party services such as send out cards, so you can literally send something to somebody as a follow-up before you even leave the restaurant that you met them for the first time and you took a picture of them on your phone and it all went into a custom document. It's already been designed with and tested within an inch of its life that you simply press the button on your phone, and off it goes in the mail from some third-party house to there and they, they fall off their chair when they get it and it even has a video in it with a QR code which we'll talk about later 24-hour call center 24 hours I mean come on what if you're working on the internet and you're all over the world with vessels and mountain cabins and islands and you don't have a 24-hour call center really what the call center goes down you're kidding right because it's Easter? No. The call center doesn't go down because it's a global thing. And people are up at funny hours of the day. And a call center never, ever should go down. No. And a chat center. So there's always somebody to chat with. If you don't really feel comfortable talking on the phone, you just get on a live chat. And they might send you over to somebody in the call center if that's more appropriate. Or the call center sends you to chat if that's more appropriate. You can move people back and forth among these different tools that uh, we, a Google Hangout, somebody's doing a live Hangout, there's 20 people in there talking about the same thing that you need help with, you just head over to the Google Hangout, here's the link from chat, that's harder to do on the phone, they send you to chat, they give you the link, you're in the Hangout, problem solved, you're off making money again. Not that hard, but you have to spend the money to put the talented people that know how to answer the phone, the people who know how to take care of people instead of hate their job. You want people that love to help people over the phone, help people all over the world, and people who speak different languages. How about that? That'd be cool, wouldn't it? You're, you're, you're having to put your thing through a translator on your iPhone or your Android phone so that you can even talk to the person in the call center, or they got such a horrible accent from India or someplace, no disrespect meant. But you need to be able to communicate with people. You need to know the idioms, the slang of the culture that you're supporting. And if you don't, well, it's going to be a whole bunch harder to support them, isn't it? And then uh, the 5-0, I call it the 5-0, like Hawaii 5-0. It's 5 is S in disguise, so it's the SO or the Snake Op Center. And I call it that instead of a war room because I don't like the word war. Uh, it is kind of a war we're in for our oceans and our land habitat and our kids, but 5-0, uh, and that was kind of a war, wasn't it, with the Hawaii and all that, McGarrett and company. Uh, but uh, a Snake Op Center, an SOC, the Snake Op Center, is about... really high-end masterminding and planning, and it's it's the equivalent of the sit room in the White House or CNN or one of those places, and it's full of gear, and it's where the leaders come uh, when it's appropriate to get together and do really high-level planning for what the next six months or what the next six years is. We think further out. We're not just planning for the next 30-day financial statement. No, we're thinking 10 years out. What is this thing going to look like in 10 years? How is it going to have an impact 
on the research that's being done, important research about how we can turn the tide back on all the mess that the world's oceans are in, or the dis almost disappearance of the land habitat for the wildlife and the rainforest. How do we think 10 years from now? What's it going to look like? I'm even afraid to look out 10 years how bad it is. But we have to. We have to ask those hard questions. And the Snake Ops Center, or SOC, which also has part of the direct response in, a, in another conversation, uh, is part of this. And then the, I have Bourne Rising down, and that's Bourne, like Jason, a Blue Ocean Underground Railway Network, which is a series of stations or rail stops, uh, 100 miles apart, that dot mostly the coastlines, but also islands and other peninsulas uh, of the world that you can literally travel. It's a circulatory system for the tribe, and you can go from station to station, meet new people, bring your people, learn new things, have new experiences, mastermind, uh, do all kinds of things in a bunch of different places, not just one place or not just some rented place. We're going to own these places. That's what a born station is for, is we own it, we make it our own, like the, they say about the girls and the boys singing in the music sing-offs. We make these stations unique to the tribe as well as to the location that they're reciting in so that you learn about all of the local lore of, the, of that particular space. And you meet people and you bring your people and you get people coming from the outlying areas of that and you teach and you motivate and you get to know each other and you build a better relationship for the tribe in the larger sense because you have these stations. And this is not a new thing. This happens all through all kinds of organizations in men's history through the uh, millennia. Sorry. No, it's okay. So that's the born, and I have born rising because it's going to be a growth curve. We can't build a, a 500 station network on six continents in 200 countries in a weekend. It's going to take time, and we're going to do it strategically, and that's part of what the Snake Ops Center is, is to get the big players in so that we can try to triage it, try, try to set the priorities of what's most important. I mean, probably a, a place like uh, L.A. or Seattle or New York or Miami or Houston is more important than a place that's inland or a place that doesn't have the same population or the same level of influence in today's world. So we're going to try to triage where they first appear, and then we're going to fill in as we go along. And then I also have marinas, rehab facilities, bed and breakfasts. Uh, we're a nautical tribe, and we're a tribe on the move. And so we're going to need places that take care of our land sharks and take care of our vessels. And we're going to own, not rent, not use the haul out, pay $7,000 for what they call an in and out. And you take a boat out on the hard, and you, it's called on the hard when it's on the land, you're working on it and then you do some work for a few weeks and then you put it back in, that's the in part, out and in, in and out, it's a lot of money. But if you own the facility, then it's not a lot of money, it's just some energy. Maybe you even have a wind vane up or you know some, I don't know, uh, probably not solar, but I mean, it's just not gonna cost that much if you own the facilities, if you own them. And B&Bs are just kind of a, sort of another Elma, and they're a combination of a born station and uh, probably nautical support because we'll have B&Bs that are right on as bed and breakfast. If you don't know that slang, B&B, bed and breakfast that's right on the coast. And there's a yacht that goes with the B&B. So you have an exchange between the land and the yacht, which is kind of like life itself. That's where all life happens is in those first few miles off of the coastlines of the world. That's what tides are about. That's what the moon is about. That's what all that rumbling and all that surfing. That's why you have surfers that care about the planet, because they're right in the middle of all that life, aren't they? So, uh, uh, a and b is an important asset in this, even though it's not one of our main part of the bicycle. It's really like Crow's Nest coastline version. The, the reason for Crow's Nest, here comes another train. One, two, looks like uh, three, yeah, three, three choo-choos, three locomotives on this one. That's one that's going to be a while. So it's gonna, I'll try to talk a little louder in this because I don't want to stop this. So the last one is closed circuit video network. 
and the closed circuit video network essentially plugging all this stuff together with great big huge screen TVs. You can just bring somebody in and have them start watching this stuff in real time, switch the channel, and they sign up. You know, not that difficult, uh, but no one's ever built one, at least not at this level that I'm talking about. They can be in the foreign stations, they can be on the yachts, the, 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 the screens that bring in the cold circuit will have it completely off the mitts of the radars of the governments and the prying eyes from the competition. Nobody's going to see this. Sorry. Sorry. It's okay. Nobody's going to see this except the, the eyes that want to see this or that we dictate will see this because we'll have passwords and we'll have virtual private networks and no way. Nobody's getting through this stuff. We've got the best of breed people behind this working to make sure this is secure. That means your communications are going to be secure. You're not going to be worried about Google looking at your email anymore because we're going to do message passing through private networks, virtual private networks with peer-to-peer -peer, uh, file handling, all that stuff we know how to do. And uh, the, the closed circuit is a really important part of this because we want our own video network that shows what we're doing just to the people that we invite. This is an invite only. This is like a yacht club or a country club model where unless you're invited, you don't get to blow in with your money, plunk it down, and then cause trouble because of your worldview or misunderstanding or you're not going to do anything. No, unless you're the person for this knighthood or this knightship, then you're not going to get invited, period. We're only, and plus we're going to, when someone is invited, then we vet them. That's the vetting part. We want to make sure you are right for this instead of taking your money and then you don't like us very much because you didn't make any. Uh, no, that's not going to work that way. Uh, we're going to first know that somebody we want to work with because of what they've done already, because of what they blogged about, because of what they made uh, a video about, because of who they volunteered with for the last 10 years. Those are the people who are going to get into this. Everybody else is like, well, go do some work and then we'll see. You know, kind of. Uh, it's going to be a small number. Okay. This is not going to be 800,000 people like some, uh, not even 80,000, maybe not even 8,000. It might be more like 800. You know, this is a whale enclave network, and that means a small number of big people, not a large number of little people. No offense, but we're looking for the players. We're looking for the hitters. We're looking for the movers, the shakers, the people with money, the people with influence, the people who have lists, the people who are bloggers, the people who can just turn on a Twitter account like, what's his name, two and a half men guy, and get a million followers on Twitter in 24 hours or something, when, uh, what is, what's his name, uh, and CNN went at it, and it took them months to, finally one of them hit the million, well, he did it in 24 hours, that was a little further into Twitter's tenure, so he could do that, uh, but <laughs> those are the kind of people we're talking about, not necessarily him, but you know what I mean, people who have influence. So that ends, uh, this, this little talk, it's, Basically, this thing's going boom, and it, there's very small number of positions available, and then it's going to get way too expensive for anybody except big, huge whales. You know, 100,000 will be the minimum, probably, hopefully by the end of July, which is coming up in a couple of weeks, a few weeks, uh, we're, we're going to be off to the races with just invite people with means and with influence and with emotional maturity and who don't really think twice about putting up 100,000 for something that's gonna save the oceans and the land habitat and the kids that are dying, all 10 million of them this year, if we haven't lowered it a little bit since the last I checked, and another 10 million pets that are inconvenient truths that we slaughter every year, at least in this country, it's probably a lot larger number around the world. So uh, it's an exciting time and it's uh, a challenge, it's kind of a challenging time because we're putting the tilt or withdraw, I call it tow, which is tilt like a knight or withdraw, go back to your cave and and sit this one out and watch for the next 10 years maybe. Maybe you never get invited again. That's kind of what tilt or withdraw is about, is having a really, really strong message that either you do it or you get to watch it. Those are your only two options. There's no maybe, there's no I'll think about it, maybe next year, no. You either do it or you don't do it. You have the money, you have the background to be able to do this and you come into it or you don't and then you wish you did. It's, it's, it's that stark of a choice. There isn't any middle ground in this. There's not going to be any follow-up. There's not going to be any begging or whining or why don't you do this. It's do or die in a few days and then you're out for possibly the rest of your life, which is the way it should be. It's This is too big to wait. 
You know, the ocean isn't too big to fail, it's failing. You know, in the rainforest, if we lose the Amazon, we might lose 20% of the whole planet's oxygen supply. And it turns into pampa grass. And we don't have any more medicines coming out then. And there's no blowing darts into frogs by these guys that have been doing it for thousands of years. Why'd we take that away? Well, we could. That's the only reason. It's not a good one. So I'm going to end it here.